Welcome everyone to a very special Global Entrepreneurship Week event um, hosted by Veragility and AZ Bio on building resilient teams. And with that, I am going to turn it over to our moderator for today, Brian Jung. Hi, Brian. Good morning, Joan, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss what we see as being a very important topic and trend uh, in the healthcare and life sciences industry, which is in terms of building resiliency in our organization. As Joan mentioned, I'm with Veragility. We are based here in Phoenix, uh, management technical consulting group uh, with a division focused on the healthcare and life sciences side. So I will moderate today and I'm going to first introduce James Bates. And James, uh, a little bit about your organization and your role um, in advance of today's discussion. Sure. My name is James Bates. I'm the founder and CEO of AdvyNow Medical. AdvyNow Medical uses artificial intelligence and augmented reality to help eliminate the overhead burden that clinics have or hospital systems have. So if you think about the time in a physician's day, they spend roughly two thirds of their time sitting behind a computer looking into the EMR. And our job is to eliminate that. And that is, that is AdvyNow Medical. Um, we are used in hospital systems, as well as urgent care, primary care, and other specialty clinics throughout the United States. Thank you, James, for participating on the panel. Jasmine, I'll turn it over to you next. A uh, brief introduction, please. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Jasmine Boddy. I'm a registered nurse and the CEO and founder of Navi Nurses. And at Navi Nurses, we are essentially the Uber of nurses. So we help people who are overwhelmed and um, feeling just unprepared to care for themselves or the loved one after an admission into a hospital uh, so that everyone can actually um, have the best quality of life um, without uh, the disruptions that we, we see um, in healthcare. Thank you. And uh, Melissa, Melissa Ray, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm Melissa Ray. I am leading the Healthcare and Life Science Division of Veragility. I have 20 years experience in biotechnology, genomic research, um, medical devices, and advanced material technology manufacturing. Really, my experience surrounds operations management, including enterprise program management, um, regulatory, quality assurance, process engineering. Um, I'm focused on building operational infrastructure and fostering a culture of reliability and quality assurance for our customers here at Veragility. Good. Thank you, Melissa. And as John mentioned, our topic is building resiliency in our teams. And we can all agree in today's world, both uh, from an organization, professional, even personal standpoint, uh, change is occurring everywhere. And those change drivers can be introduction of new product lines, mergers and acquisitions, introduction of new technology, uh, et cetera. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jasmine, first. Can you just talk about what your organization is seeing in terms of um, the changes that are occurring? Because obviously, that's a key catalyst to building resilience in your team. Jasmine? Sure. So um, I'm probably an outlier here, but um, I started off the year actually still working at the bedside um, and, and our company was formed in January. So we're still kind of new and I think we're changing on a daily basis with um, learning new ways of doing things and um, making uh, you know, changes in response to what we're seeing as far as our clients and healthcare and how they're being discharged and what change what changes they're experiencing from a patient perspective. Um, so, I think just like growing changes itself is really what we're going through as an organization and learning how to bring up the right nurses to fill our leadership roles and um, how do we now scale what we're building. So that's that's really what we're doing. Thank you. And I know leadership we'll talk about a little bit later is an important component to overall building resiliency in your organization. Uh, James, what about your perspective? What are you seeing in your organization as it relates to change uh, 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 happening in, in your group? Sure. I mean, healthcare is going through really transformational changes over, you know, it goes through a lot of cycles, but really over the past five years, 
what we're seeing is a massive verticalization of the healthcare services. So you're seeing hospital systems buying clinics, uh, primary care, urgent care, they're buying specialty care, such that Banner owns all specialties, you know, and all, all activities, you'll ever have a relationship, you'll want to do it with Banner type of situation, right? And you end up with a, a doctor that had a primary care practice or a doctor that had a specialty practice that was an owner operator that now works for somebody else. And to be able to support this type of change just within the, the practice community, the systems that they use are going through transformational changes as well. And so every doctor that you talk to can tell you how they hate changing EMRs as an example. <laughs> and and any type of EMR change will automatically bring convulsions, you know, through the next five minutes of bad memories. So, so what, what is happening across the board is that new IT and new systems are being merged together with these mergers and acquisitions. People are having to learn new workflows. They're having to get trained more. They're being expected to work for a salary instead of actually getting paid as a percentage of, of you know, what the per patient actually pays them. And so these massive changes are causing a lot of people to be uncertain about their future. And as you're building a team, you need to basically build the team, really preparing your staff for these changes. Instead of hiring people to solve a problem today, you need to hire them to solve a problem tomorrow. Very good point, James. And, and one of the things that you bring up is that uh, employees are not only changing, but they're still having to maintain what they do on a daily basis as they transition. And so there's a lot of support that is required. Uh, Melissa, you work with a variety of different organizations. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of, of change and the impact that's having on organizations? Yeah, uh, well, just throughout my career, I have weathered many mergers and acquisitions as well as corporate reorganizations. Um, and I, what I've learned is the, the common theme for success is effective and consistent communication. Um, the most difficult decisions for me have always been the ones that impact employees' lives. Uh, I don't feel over-communicating is a bad decision at all. I think it's a good thing. I've had a lot of managers through these acquisitions um, say that we can't inform the employees until we're actually walking them out the door um, for fear that maybe we'll lose them before the final decision has been made. And, you know, the, the employees are going to leave anyway if they feel insecure um, or at a minimum, they're going to be actively pursuing other opportunities that they feel will have more safety for them and their family. Um, you, you get them to stay by showing them there's a support system and building trust within the team. Trust builds the dedication. Um, a joint sense of accomplishment and safety builds loyalty and a sense to belong to something greater. And I think that employees really need that sense to enjoy the work that they're doing truly. It's interesting because uh, what I'm getting from all of your comments is that building that resiliency at a team level really starts with working with each individual employee uh, to build that uh, to build that resiliency um, and then moving it out to the team. Let's talk a little bit about uh, leadership, James. What uh, Where do you see leadership playing a role in terms of um, supporting change and building resiliency in the organization? Sure. So, you know, the, the term leadership is, is often vague and, and a lot of people come in there and they'll say, okay, well, what does leadership really mean? Um, you know, I, I like to describe leadership and, and kind of attributes that, that people have. And, and as you're building a culture of the organization, a culture that has strong attributes that espouse leadership, then you actually have resiliency in the team. So one of those attributes is actually the, the concept of, of doing good as you make a difference, right? And as you're dealing with a leader, there's, there's, a many, there's many ways that you can actually make a difference and not all of them are good. And, and you can think about passive aggressive cultures as, as one of these examples where all of a sudden you have a change in the organization 
um, and you have employees that are actively trying not to help, right? And that, that passive aggressive nature actually will breed instability and breed problems throughout the organization. So when you say leadership, what is what traits are you looking for? You're looking for people who are actually out to positively help, positively, actively do good as they're making a difference. And so that's kind of step one of, of how I would describe leadership traits that you're looking for as you're going through changes because these changes will happen and right. ultimately the the idea that any type of you know passive you know obstructionism is going to help it is just a fallacy and is really immaturity and so as you're building a mature organization as you're building a mature leadership group you're looking for people who can think beyond and can be part of the solution and not, not part of the problem Thank you. I know when we work with organizations to help build resiliency in their change management program, starting at that executive leadership level, just in terms of education, you know, what do they need to do? How do they need to act, et cetera? Uh, Melissa, can you comment on the executive leadership layer and even as it translates to the, the mid-level manager or frontline employee in terms of helping to build out that consistency of messaging and resiliency? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. It isn't just the teams that need to be resilient. Um, leadership needs to be resilient as well. Uh, adaptability, optimism, uh, and the ability to bounce back from setbacks, I think, are essential to being a resilient leader. Um, leaders have to cultivate in themselves what they want to see in their team uh, in order to advance and thrive. I, I think that's really important to kind of walk the walk, I guess you would say. Um, paying attention and being available shows the team that the leader is engaged and an active participant um, in the success of the team and the company. And I think when you see that in your leaders, you want to emulate that as a, maybe a middle manager and a supervisor. I've had some great mentors in my life, and um, I think it's key to being a good leader is to be a good mentor for your team as well. Very good points. So uh, Jasmine, it sounds like you're living through change, a uh, very significant change in terms of the business model, et cetera. How do you, uh, how, do, how does your leadership try to engage to keep people informed about uh, and help them build the resiliency to, to, to cope with the changes that are occurring? You know, I think, um, first of all, I'm, I'm leading nurses who are, they're burnt out and they're tired and, um, leadership is really, really key for them right now. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning of the year, you know, I was one of those frontline nurses myself, and I really began to understand what it is that makes getting through that change and that uncertainty um, so important. And um, for me, I think it it's just um, embodied in, in servant leadership model. And that means really putting the needs of, um, of your team first and really thinking about their well-being and just something as simple as listening to them, taking time to understand who they are as people and, and showing them that you can work right alongside them in, in these difficult times is just so incredibly important. And so as I'm building my own culture, that's very much what I incorporate. I take the time to listen and, and learn from my nurses. Who are they? What are their goals? And what is it they'd like to accomplish? And, and how do I recognize them not only as amazing clinicians, but as a human being? And, and I think when we have these really open, honest dialogue um, that starts with me being vulnerable myself and talking about things that are scary or um, challenging for me, it just opens everything up to a more personal level that I think sets the foundation for them being able to lead and asking them to do things that may be challenging or, or having them step outside of their comfort zone. I think Jasmine, those are very good points. And one of the things I think that you mentioned is that feedback loop in terms of listening to uh, the people that are being impacted by change and it sort of becomes an iterative process and sometimes it's new for executive leadership to be able to adapt to that sort of iterative feedback. Uh, James, uh, have you guys put together anything in terms of uh, creating that iterative loop or feedback loop, but which often helps to sort of reinforce the resiliency needed to cope with change? Well, as in, in a startup, I mean, we have 
you know, 20 something employees yeah. that are actual employees. And then, you know, probably just as many contractors. So we're, we're not, we're not a large company. And so the right. idea of not being resilient, uh, you don't work here if, right. if you're not resilient. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in, in terms of specific policies, um, you know, we our, our goal is to hire, to support our culture. And part of our culture, our key traits that we try to espouse is, is really centered around attitude, right? And, and so every single person has to be willing to communicate and has to be willing to, to really go to the next level in order to survive a startup and survive my company. Right. And so it's, it, it, you just have to, you have to be that type of person. And if you're not, then it, it's not going to work. Right. So it, it's a, it, it, we're a little bit different. Now our clients are, are, are the pra medical practices and the hospital systems. And, and that is where we see change and we support change pretty mm -hmm. dramatically um, in and of ourselves. So what we, when we are implementing software, which fundamentally changes the workflow of, of a lot of people, um, what we do is try to make sure that we're heard because it, it doesn't matter how good you think your platform is. And we believe ours is pretty good, right? Um, it's gonna be difficult for people to change. And as long as you're listening to their complaints and you're trying to do your best to, to right. support and, and make sure that they're heard, then I think you can support resiliency in the organization and acceptance of the change. I think you bring up a, a fantastic point around the uh, resiliency impact as it relates to the culture of the organization and also factoring that into the people that you're bringing into the organization, that you're hiring into the organization, et cetera, because that resiliency needs to be a core function of that person's skill sets or capabilities. Absolutely. Going forward. So uh, good point there. Um, Melissa, how do you develop, if, if we go to behavioral change, how do you develop sort of a clear understanding of um, or to provide some guidance around the specific behavioral changes that need to occur within an organization, because it sort of becomes the culture, as James described, the culture and fabric of the organization, which helps develop that resiliency. How do you go about either identifying what changes occur or coaching those, uh, the people in that organization? Well, I, I think that really change happens at the individual level. Um, for a group or an organization to change, all the individuals within that group or organization must change. Um, it's really important to uh, identify the business need. And, and once that need is really understood, create an awareness within the team, um, which helps drive them to a common goal. Um, having that common goal, I think, leads to a desire to participate in achieving it. Uh, you know, once you really understand that, uh, you need to then provide training and coaching um, around the needs that are required. Um, so the team can have the knowledge and ability to achieve that change. Um, and then once the change is achieved, you really need to have reinforcement um, that needs to really be utilized to ensure the change sticks uh, and that individuals don't revert back to previous habits. And I won't say bad habits because it, they may not have been bad. They were just the way it was done prior to that. Um, but to really help reinforce the change you want to see, um, there needs to be consistent reinforcement, positive reinforcement um, to help maintain that level of change. So you mentioned uh, Melissa awareness which is part of a key component to building resiliency is having that open communication. Uh, Jasmine, you talked about working with your nurses that are very overworked and um, by the nature of their job. Um, how did you work with them to sort of, because uh, I've heard it sort of described as you've really got to get down to the level of what's in it for me on an individual level mm -hmm. in terms of helping those people understand the uh, 
positive nature of a change and building that resiliency. Can you talk specifically about what you've experienced in working with some of the nurses that you've described? Yeah, so, you know, the first thing, and, and just kind of um, building upon what Melissa was saying, I think that there's so much to be said about individual resilience. I also think that there's a responsibility of the organization itself to support an environment where that resilience can actually happen. And, and, and part of behavior change, we know it, it's, it's not easy, um, but I think if we create the opportunities for behavior change to not only happen, but be sustained over time, um, that's really important. So for, for me, you know, as I'm building something, I'm trying to integrate things, you know, whether it's monthly activities where people can get together and decompress and just talk. Um, because my community is, my nurses work out of people's homes. So it's not like we have a center where people can come into. I don't have a place that I can use. And so I have to be really creative and thoughtful about what am I doing to create a really supportive culture that exists um, online? And, and how am I getting nurses to engage and dialogue with each other and talk about things that are difficult? And so that begins with me and, and what I'm creating to enable that resilience to really um, come to life. So I, I hope that I hope that answers the question. No, it, it, it does very well, actually. <laughs> and uh, um, Melissa, James, any comment you want to make on this? Uh, we're sort of in this, uh, we're, we're on Zoom today, we're in the Zoom based world, and we've got people working in different locations. Um, how have you tried to keep a group focused a team awareness, et cetera, in this, in this era we're living in, which is web-based Zoom meetings. James? Yeah, I, you know, the, the, the Zoom world makes things very challenging. You know, it, it, as of this panelist, you know, I, I appreciate everyone who's attending today, but the, the percentage of people who are probably 100% focused on us you know, it, it is is not 100% of the people. Right. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so um, ultimately, we as a leadership team and as leaders in the organization need to make sure that our employees are engaged. And in keeping that engagement um, in a world of Zoom is is incredibly challenging. So, um, really, uh, you know. Culture is really created by the values of the individual that are part of that organization. You know, the, there's always a, a, a culture mission values type of arguments within within organizations and how do you create and, and support them. But, uh, you know, as as values, it, having everyone have an ownership stake in what they do and having them own their output and their outcome, even in a virtual world, allows them to stay engaged and allows an organization to stay resilient and, and stay cohesive. Thank you. Um, Melissa, I was going to ask you, um, sometimes change and as you're building this resiliency, employees just based on lack of knowledge, lack of, an air, uh, of awareness can Sort of dig in their heels and uh, maybe not sort of move to the, to the desired future state. What are some of the thoughts you have in terms of maintaining quality and productivity as we're building the resiliency in our teams uh, and still being sort of bombarded by all this change that's going on? Uh, I think that effective reinforcement can sustain the change that needs to be made and prevent individuals from slipping back into old ways of doing work. Um, it can build momentum during the transition from your current state to your future state by creating uh, a history of success and sustained change. The, the team needs to really feel that um, there, there is a new way of doing things that, that's been reinforced through uh, positive training activities and, and reiterative activities. Um, effective reinforcement can come in simple forms, right? It can be dashboards, um, tracking of KPIs. Uh, it can come in the form of regular and uh, informative employee reviews, right? Employee reviews are that dreaded thing that the managers always hate to have to do. You have 
you know, 15 employees and you need to spend hours to make sure each individual review is, is done well and is beneficial to the team, uh, to that team member. Um, I found that the most effective form of reinforcement is positive reinforcement. And Jasmine kind of spoke to this in, in having that individual conversation with the team. Um, I think that regular positive feedback uh, reinforces the change you want to see. You know, there, there are monetary rewards um, such as competitive salaries, right? Benefits, uh, which always needs to be proportional to their performance, uh, which is where, again, those performance reviews become important. Um, then there's work-life balance, which is uh, highly individualized and requires the leaders to really understand what motivates their team. Uh, working from home has become the new normal um, for a lot of people, and a lot of people want to keep it that way specifically. Um, but for those that have to return back, on-site daycare services and on-site gyms, uh, those are really important. Free healthy lunches uh, can be a great motivator um, or pets, pets being allowed to come into the office. Um, even free coffee can go, I think, a long way to making employees feel appreciated in the moment, um, which I think really helps build that productivity. Thank you, Melissa. I think one of the things I heard from you is that building resiliency isn't a one-time event. It's really sort of a continuous, ongoing process that you build into the culture of your organization. Jasmine, do you want to touch on that a little bit in terms of kind of that continuous nature of building resiliency in your organization? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think my nurses, for example, they all work still in a hospital full time. And they do this on the side. And what's so magical about what we're doing is that spending, having them spend an hour or two hours with a client helps them actually with their resilience when they actually go back to work in the hospital. Um, and it's amazing to see that. And, and I think my message in that is it doesn't take very much time for that to happen. It can just be a small amount of, um, allowing people to do something that they feel not only makes a difference, but it brings them joy. And, um, and part of that, obviously it's measured with their quality. So, you know, I get, you know, text messages from my clients all the time, like so-and-so was amazing and we're so happy to have them. And the very first thing I do is I clip that, that note and I send it straight off to the nurse. Like I want them to know in real time, as much as it's happening, that this person really appreciated them. And this specifically is what you did. And I think that's something I'm trying to be mindful of. I don't want them to just think like, oh, you're doing a great job. Like, what is it exactly that that person did? So that way they can do that same thing again with someone else. And it is, it's using that positive reinforcement, um, but really like pinpointing what it is that they're doing really well. And not only um, not only do I tell the, the, the nurse like, hey, this is what you've done, but I also like to share that with, with the clients. Is it okay if I share what you've told me? It's really important for them. And, and they like to hear that too. They want to know that people are being recognized for their work. And um, I don't know, I just, I think it's amazing. And it just kind of like, it happens once, but then following up and continuing to do that, it's that repetition and continuity that Melissa was talking about of just, you know, not being a one-time thing. And um, I think when you do have conversations where they're more challenging, it definitely, it makes it easier because there's a lot you now have to support of, hey, you've done this all really well all of these other times. And this is an area where we can grow a little bit more on. And um, I, I don't know, I think, I think that's how I see what we're building right now. And it's still a work in progress for us and what we're doing. And oh, sure. you know, like I've grown from this like bedside nurse to becoming a leader. And it's so easy to sit and think about leadership and study it and understand the theory, but actually practicing it and doing it is, is entirely different. So I'm still learning and I get to learn from James and Melissa too here, which is great. <laughs> so you, you've, you very much have described the continuous nature of building that uh, resiliency. James, what, what, what's your kind of thought in terms of kind of keeping, keeping the company moving forward, even though you're going through these changes, et cetera, the whole field is going through changes as you described. How do you sort of keep people continuously focused on moving forward either through um, productivity or quality or however you look at it? 
I'll, 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 I'll start by commenting on Jasmine's comment. Um, you know, there's, I've never stopped learning. And so as soon as I stop learning about what it means to be a good leader, then I think I, I'm, I'm about going to die the next day or something. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's amazing. You know, I'm, I'm 50 years old. I'm an old man. Um, you know, when I was 29, I got promoted to vice president and, and I get, thought I was going to be a great leader. And my, my ideas and concepts about what it meant to be a great leader um, when I was 29 are very different today than they were then. And it, they're even different than they were, you know, five years ago um, from now. And, and so um, it, it's amazing as we continue to evolve and as we continue to learn how to motivate people, how to keep a, a positive culture and how to reinforce those learnings. Um, how it changes our own behavior as, as leaders of organizations. So, um, in, in going, going back to your comment, um, you know, I, 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 I think it all comes down to really supporting the values that supports your culture. Um, and in, in an organization, how do you support the values that, that you want your employees to own and to espouse. Um, because though that, that demonstration of values actually creates the culture of the organization. So, um, you know, at AdvyNow, we, we have um, a culture that's called empowering. We just use the term empowering ownership, respect, urgency and then think like a customer right that these are our culture you know our culture that we put up on the wall and and it, the the interesting thing is that if you're empowering somebody and you're giving them all the tools they need to be successful then ultimately they're going to feel that resilient and they're going to feel like they can make a difference and as long as they're thinking like a customer right if 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 they were if they were receiving what you're selling them, would they be happy or sad? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> and as long as you can keep that, that humility associated with being a consumer um, as you're selling a product or as you're leading a group, um, then I think you can maintain a, a very positive culture. Um, I'm going to keep, I'm going to talk a little bit about the term respect and, and it's abused a lot today in today's pop culture. Um, it, cause it, 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 respect is, is terms to mean something that it really doesn't mean. Um, right. Respect. He disrespected me, you know, and, and, and that's not really what it's about. It's respect is respecting people for who they are and respect is for respecting people for what you know that they can accomplish. Now, if they don't accomplish it, then obviously they did not earn that respect, but you don't disrespect them by being angry or yelling or, or basically being insulting. Your job as a manager, your job as a leader, if someone is not meeting expectations is to respect them as an, as an individual, as a contributor, and basically just put a plan together that, that spells out the expectations in a way that they could never misunderstand. And as you're going through change, as long as you are clearly articulating um, the type of change you want to happen and why a specific employee is not meeting those expectations, then you can end up with a positive impact out of any type of performance improvement plan instead of the negative, traditionally negative impact. And, and that all starts with respect. Thank you, James. Jasmine, do you want to just uh, echo anything regarding James' comment regarding respect? I've heard it uh, kind of, I hear it in between the lines in terms of your discussion, but do you want to just add to kind of James's comment, what you're seeing in your organization? Sure. You know, I actually think about um, Brene Brown and um, she says to be clear is to be kind. Um, and I think that's not, that it can't be understated. Like it's, um, Clarity is so important. And I think that is one of the greatest forms of respect that you can have for someone is to just be open and honest and clear in, in what you're expecting, like what you're what you're mentioning. And um, and also in the feedback that you give them, I think inherently people just they want to go to work and they want to do a good job and they want to feel like they're contributing something. And 
And when you can give them the autonomy to just, and that's what I love what, what I'm what I'm doing now is I just say, hey, these are the goals I want to achieve, go do it and make it happen. And they have the ability to go and, and do how how they see fit and you know, just giving like like parameters. But um I think respecting their their um abilities that they bring to the table and allowing them to shine is probably one of the best things I can do as a leader, allowing them to tap into their creative side or, or what they really like. And I, I really find I'm enjoying it more than I more than I ever would have imagined. It, it, that, that message of clarity is very important, uh, as you talked about. And uh, Melissa, sometimes we see companies that maybe not have, have established a strategic plan, et cetera. What, uh, what should organizations be doing to create that clarity in terms of the direction they're heading? Because that's a that's an important backdrop to all of this in terms of building resiliency. Yeah, I, you know, some of the things that really resonated with James and Jasmine for me were was the empowerment, respect, and autonomy. Um, one of the things that I have found um, is that you, you know, you hire great people. You hire people smarter than yourselves, more talented than yourselves to make sure that everything that is required is being fulfilled. And then you empower that team and allow them to grow within that work that they're doing. Um, I, one of the most satisfying things for me has always been to hire a team, give them a work plan, and then let them go, right? Have the autonomy to do the work that needs to be achieved and see them grow in that role. That is that is um, always been one of the, the most exciting things of being a manager, or being a leader, um, is getting to see the group grow within themselves and move on maybe even to better things, right? Or other things. Um, having, being able to see them 20 years down the road and say, wow, I might've been a small portion of the great work that they're doing now. Um, and I think companies need to have plans for that. They need to have a system that enables the team to grow and, and enjoy new things, training programs and events, right? That, that help them in the moment grow to be something beyond what they thought maybe was possible. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions that have come in. One is um, obviously COVID has forced great change and all we've had to all build resiliency. Um, in the world that uh, after COVID, um, how do you see your ability to, or how are you managing uh, expectations in terms of potential changes in business models or just changes of working in your employees, or maybe you don't see any change at all in terms of uh, the post, post COVID world, whenever we get there. Uh, Jasmine, do you wanna make a comment on that uh, um, about the post COVID world and resiliency? Sure, you know, I think um, post COVID looks pretty different for nurses, you know, and um, I think for us right now, our greatest, um, our greatest mission is to try to keep nurses working at the bedside um, as much as possible. So that way they can provide really good care and actually take mm -hmm. care of our community. So it's not necessarily my primary ambition for my business, but it is definitely a secondary goal. That's really important for me that we keep nurses working and how do we, how do we take where they're at? Um, because it's hard. Like I worked on a COVID unit and I understand what my, what my nurses have gone through and I'm still grieving. Like, it's a process, it takes time. And I think allowing people um, that, that space to feel safe um, is really, really important. No matter where you're coming from, what you've done, it's just a lot of people have lost things in a different way and it affects who they are and, and who they're as people. And um, I think that's the most important thing, no matter what we're doing, what industry, um, just recognizing all the people that work for you, um, They've gone through something as a human and um, how do we allow them to continue to grow and, and acknowledging that, like, I think it would be terrible if we didn't recognize that there's change that happened and, and we overlooked it. So I think moving forward and allowing it to shape who we are and how we see the world differently um, was really important. 
Thank you. Um, James, I was going to ask you a question that had come in in terms of uh, how can a company's action improving diversity, equity, and inclusion increase team resiliency? Um, thoughts on that? Yeah, I think for any company to be successful over, over the long term, you have to have different thoughts um, and, and different ways of looking at a problem. Um, my view of diversity is, is, is not only just about skin color, it's also about age, it's also about, you know, what countries they're from or, or what backgrounds they've had. It's, it, it, you, what you want is for people to come in with diverse ways of looking at problems. And if you have people coming in with diverse ways of looking at problems, then you're going to be able to solve the problem in, in the most efficient way without blind spots, if you will, as you go through. And so, you know, from, from, from that perspective, you want to be as inclusive as possible to include different people with different backgrounds. Thank you. Melissa, any comment on that uh, as it relates to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? You know, I, I've, I've recently, um, encountered the need to really build out diversity within the supply chain. Um, it's not the diversity requirements right now. Um, everybody's been impacted by COVID for sure. Um, and being able to make sure that you're reaching out to local vendors um, and, and including a diverse background in that supply chain is is really so important to building out uh, a good organization. And, um, you know, that, feed, that feeds back to the employees, right? Reaching out for diversity helps bring it into the, to the team as well. Um, we're all better when we work together. And so I think that being able to really build out that diversity internally, as well as the supply chain that you bring in is very, very important. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, I'm going to come back to you because um, you talked a little bit about KPIs and dashboards as a way to sort of measure outcomes, which also uh, so we can see where we're at in relation to change, but also kind of helps us focus on resiliency. Can you just touch on that a little bit and how do you create those outcomes? How do you communicate them? What have you seen in this area? Um, I, I think it really needs to feed back into that kind of strategic plan for an organization. Um, once you have that goal, you can build out the details of actually getting there and then utilizing those steps um, to make sure that the employees have a clear understanding of how to get there, um, what the process is, what that metric means. Um, you know, you see numbers thrown at employees all the time. You have to meet this goal. You have to meet this goal, but they may not always understand how that feeds into the bigger program. Um, this, you know, the leaders have the high level goal strategic plan and the individuals doing the work don't always have that communication to them that shows them what they're doing feeds into all of these better and larger items. Um, Better is not the right word, all, uh, right? But all of these um, steps that are required for a company to be successful is all based on the work that the team is doing. And so being able to communicate that through goals and KPIs, I think is, is great, but it only works effectively if the team understands what that means is the, in a larger sense. Great, thank you. So, so what I've, I've heard some themes here in terms of building resiliency around um, clarity, uh, communication, awareness, uh, feedback. Um, James, I'm gonna throw this to you. Um, you encounter an organization that hasn't implemented any of these programs. Where, where, does, where would you advise a company starting in terms of implementing a, Sometimes we call it an organization change management program, et cetera. How do, how do people start? I've had the opportunity of leading two turnarounds as an executive brought in from the outside to, to do that. Um, so it, it, it's actually a, a very simple formula. And, and the first formula has to start with creating 
the the culture traits that you want everyone in the culture, everyone in the company to espouse. And 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 to be honest, most of the time in my both previous experiences that I've done this, the the staff look at this as a joke, right? They they start it and they say, oh, it's a, it's another culture exercise and, and, and you just have to grin and bear it and, and kind of go through it. And, and then from that, you create goals and then you apply ownership to each of the owners. And, and usually within an organization that has had a failing culture or a failing execution, which, you know, in, in, in the previous two cases that I was in was, was the scenario, um, it usually means leadership changes. Because the leaderships that the leadership that is is instilled are are not espousing the values that create the culture and will deliver the ownership and empowerment to the team to be able to execute accordingly. So um, usually that's not a very popular thing to say that, that, you know, you've got to go in there and wipe it out. And it's a, it's a big joke. Whenever a new leader comes in, the first thing they do is bring in their henchmen, right? I mean, it's a, another common theme that, that's, that usually is said. Um, but the reason for that is, is exactly that change management piece of it and, and being able to deliver on an execution oriented culture or a customer facing culture thinking like a customer culture or a culture that respects individuals. You know, I've, I had a situation in a company that went in and, and the leadership would just sit and demean and yell at everybody. Right. I mean, and that was, that was the culture and, and you come in and you say, well, you know, we're not into that, right. Let's not do that. <laughs> and so, so, so ultimately you end up, you know, terminating a lot of people, not because they're, you know, very bad people, but just because they have, they've been trained very badly. And in order to change an organization, you, you have to, you have to create that jolt. Right. So I don't know if that's what you were looking for, Brian. Yeah, but, no, actually, uh, that was quite good. And you mentioned a point, I think that's very important is the, is really establishing ownership of those goals and, and sharing that ownership uh, across different um leaders within your organization so that it's not just James's plan or Brian's vision. It's really the vision of the organization. And that, that was a great point. I think you had made James uh, related to that. Um, Jasmine, I was going to ask you, we had a great question come up. How do we encourage our team members to be resilient and supporting each other? How do we sort of build that sort of a capability that, Hey, it's not only, leaders sort of promoting programs around resiliency, but how do we sort of build that in terms of how uh, employees can, can help support each other to be resilient? That's a really, really good question. And I think um, the first part of that begins with role modeling. Like when I think about myself as a leader, like how am I as a person engaging those around me to do that? Um, and showing that this is like what I think is the right thing to do. And, and I think that begins with me. Um, and then it's really inviting people who, um, and it's inviting people to, to participate in that. And sometimes what I find or what I've seen is that when you engage the people who are the most disruptive or disengaged, it actually works out beautifully. You can you can actually find them to be so much more engaging and and inherently, if they're the people that are maybe causing the environment to not feel as welcoming or resilient in general, um, it can change the whole dynamic enormously. And how do you tap into those people and figure out how can I utilize them, but in a different way? So that's really that's really interesting for me. And I think um, based on my experience. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still growing and figuring this out from the top now, but what I learned along the way was that the middle management is just so key to everything. And you can have a, a vision and mission for the whole organization, but there's oftentimes a pretty big disconnect and, and there's going to be variability with people, but how do you kind of keep that middle line um, of, of your leadership to actually continue instilling what it is that the very bottom needs to experience? Um, and, and, and I think engaging that, that middle leadership is, is it an important step in terms of, um, creating that domino effect where yep. one person can then affect someone else. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, 
There's also, uh, in terms of introducing uh, change management programs, there's availability from a, from a leadership training perspective, even kind of what is resiliency, just getting, getting that process started. So I've seen, in fact, I've been involved in programs where we've actually gone into sort of teach about what organization change management is and, and sort of impacting resiliency. I've got a, a question here from Scott. Scott, thank you for the for the question. Um, Scott's question is follow up from our cultural change from outside entities. I work for a large organization. Every two years, they would bring in outside consultants to change the culture, streamline working systems. Employees would always get burned out from the change, you know, always change and it was demoralizing. Can you comment on how to make a change stick and the follow through that's required? Uh, James, can you tackle that one, please? Sure. Um, you know, it's, I, I'm going to, I'm going to say something and I don't mean to be insulting to your previous employer, but if, if you have a company that's bringing in outside consultants every two years to change your culture, you've got a CEO problem, right? I mean, you, you've got, you've got an executive leadership issue there. Um, and if, if the executive leadership is changing every two years and they're bringing in the outside consultants, then they're doing it wrong, right? They should be hiring new, new second tier leaders underneath the executive staff to be instilling the culture and making it last. A, a consultant is never gonna make anything last. Um, and, it, it, you, and a consultant can help people who want help to go facilitate a problem solving solution. But a consultant is never gonna be the driver of the solution inside a company. And it, it sounds like to me, again, just reading this note, Scott, that, um, that that is what has happened is they would say, okay, we're going to go spend a million dollars, you know, for McKenzie or whoever to come in and, and tell us what to do because no one will listen to us if we say it. Right. And then McKenzie comes in and tells them, but nobody listens to McKenzie either. <laughs> so, so you end up never actually solving a problem, but getting a whole bunch of initiatives that all of the leadership, you know, faux support, but they don't really support because they didn't really own it. And, uh, and so it all comes down to, again, um, the ability of the executive leadership to lead by example, create a culture, espouse values that they support. And again, they can bring in a consultant to help them do this. But if they're not owning it and driving it through the organization, then it will never last. Melissa, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, give you 60 seconds to ans answer this question. How best can the leader uh, pass the torch in terms of the years they've invested in passing the torch on uh, to, to future leaders? Well, it, it really comes with training a good team. Um, you can't pass a torch in a day. Uh, it comes from relying on your team and helping embolden and grow your team uh, so that they understand the methods and the reasoning for the culture that's been developed. Um, I think that I've, I've in, encountered a number of organizations that have, like Scott mentioned, redone their, their culture change um, over and over. And it, and I agree with James, it is an executive level it's, issue. And yeah, so it loses its credibility quickly if you're constantly very quickly. Changing, yeah. So. And, and everybody thinks, oh, it's just another meeting that we have to attend and, and do kumbaya, but it, that isn't what they're getting out of it, right? They're not trusting it. They're not involved. Yeah. They're not invested. So um, I really, it comes from the executive leader having a good team that could step in and fill right. a void if something were to happen. Well, we are at the, uh, at a, the bottom of the hour. And uh, uh, I wanted to just close by, first of all, thanking Jasmine, James, and Melissa for their contributions. A, a few closing thoughts. One is this building resiliency has to be a conscious effort in your organization. This doesn't happen randomly. And what you heard are some very important points around communication, clarity, awareness to help build that res resiliency. And the other key takeaway I have is this is not a one-time event. This is sort of a continuous process in terms of continuing to build that resiliency. So I wanted to thank you as the panelists. Joan, I wanted to thank you from the AZ Bio in terms of helping to promote and organize this. And uh, 
good discussion and very relevant to what we're seeing in today's world. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, and a big thank you to James and Jasmine and Melissa um, for you know sharing your insights on what does have to be a continually um, you know, revisited subject. The world is changing around us, and if we are not resilient as organizations and our people within our organizations are not supported so that they can be resilient, um, the next challenge and the next challenge will get harder and harder. So this was an important discussion today. We're truly grateful to all of you for that. And um, we look forward to continuing these conversations in the future. And with that, um, to our audience, thank you for joining us today. Um, for those of you that will be joining us online afterwards, um, feel free to um, visit the link that will be provided for you on the YouTube site so that you can learn more about our speakers in this topic. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.